Hey, what up, Gabby? Hey, Lou. You headed over to the studio soon or what? Oh, yeah. No, I just stopped to get some of this Caribbean culture I got out here in Miami. Uh, bon deux pâtes, s'il vous plaît. Cool. Well, soak it on up and get on over here because we got a show to record. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm on my way. All right, well, I'll see you soon. All right, I'll see you soon. Papa Wateri, Papa Yemno Chef. Et voilà, Gim. This is mine. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This week on The Radar, we're celebrating Black History Month. Nydia Simone of Black Tina showcases her latest project, The Platano Pipeline. Catalina Eccleston talks black girl magic with Goyo from Chokip Town. And Lou Lewis co-hosts and takes us to the historic Hampton House. This is a very special episode because Radar's Lou Lewis is here from Los Angeles. Welcome to Miami, Lou. Uh, thanks for having me, Gabby. It's great to be here for Black History Month where Caribbean culture is everywhere. It's like a flag. And we're just a few hundred miles north of the motherland. Uh, by the way, I noticed uh, reggaeton's a pretty big deal here, huh? Uh, it's practically a religion. By the way, I'm pretty sure that's the first time anyone's spoken Haitian Creole on this show. Did you grow up speaking? Uh, yes, I've spoken it fluently my whole life. Oh, so you were like the opposite of a disappointment to your fellow Haitian family members growing up. What was that like? Pretty great, actually. But hey, why don't we start the show? Why don't we? Let's go. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to make films. And after seeing movies like Do the Right Thing, Princess Bride, Goonies, and Ace Ventura, I knew that filmmaking was a life for me. Uh, that's a very eclectic list of movies right there. I know, right? What can I say? Inspiration works in mysterious ways. Hollywood still has a lot of catching up to do. But thanks to the rise of digital streaming, movie makers don't have to wait around for major production companies to give them their big breaks. In Hollywood, we have a saying, hurry up and wait. Because after you rush to make it out there, you most likely will have to wait around to get your shot. Unless you take matters into your own hands. Ain't that right, Mark? Who, me? Yes, you. I hear you're quite the filmmaker. I dabble. Walk with me. I like the shirt. Thank you. Got you one. Oh, thanks, man. Let's go. Let's roll. Yeah, man. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Good. We're at the historic Hampton House here in Overtown. This is Edwin. He's gonna give us a tour today and give us some more information on how great this place really is. Uh, this was a Green Book Motel that a lot of blacks actually had the opportunity to stay in because in other hotels around in the Miami area, they were not allowed to stay in. So allow me to show you around a bit. Okay. All right. This is the room of the greatest Muhammad Ali, a.k.a. Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. And this is the room that inspired the feature film One Night in Miami and also the stage play. But this is the room where he stayed with three of his closest friends, Minister Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and legendary football player Jim Brown. Dude, welcome, man. This is one of my favorite places to be at the Hampton House. No, I definitely can feel the history, even just being in here. Filmmaking is so much fun, man. Like, you're a filmmaker also, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My favorite thing to do when I'm not on set for radar. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, I um, released a, a feature film two years ago titled Murder Gardens, um, and I was just inspired by a lot of the black directors and filmmakers who came right. before me, like Spike Lee, John Singleton. You know, you're also a filmmaker and an actor and yeah. a content creator and a, whole, and a little bit of everything. So what, what inspired you to get into this business? Uh, just wanting to get my story out there, you know what I mean? Like, uh, wanting to contribute to this industry that I love so much about, like, filmmaking, storytelling, all that. So I think uh, when I got to LA, I wanted to carve my own niche out there. You know, I wanted to say like, hey, I want to do something we also represent for the Haitians out there. So um, just being able to create my own content. Uh, I created a web series called My Roommate Duh. And the whole reason was because because growing up I was told like, well, you'll never play the lead. You know, you're more of like the sidekick or the, the side character. And I was like, no, I can, I can be a lead. I, I know what a lovable loser is. You know? <laughs> I can do this. So and I feel like filmmaking is the best way to preserve history also. Yeah, because as you can see, we can tell the stories and highlight certain things that may be overlooked. Totally agree. In your opinion though, man, how important is diversity and having people that look like you and I actually be in these films and be in these projects and be represented on the big screen and television? I think a lot of time when people think you want representation, that means they want somebody who who is out there being like, I'm gonna be a super Haitian, like I'm gonna have the flag. It's like, no, we just want somebody that just looks like you. Right. Just that simplicity. I remember growing up as a kid, one of my favorite superheroes was Superman. Yeah. Love Superman. But I remember for Halloween, I was like, well, I can't be Superman because I don't look like Superman. Right. Right. Just that right. simple 
cognitive dissonance you have where you're like, well, I don't look like that. Thing. And nowadays, we have more superiors that look uh, of a certain race. You know, we have that, and it's like it, it's it's inspiring children to know that, hey, I can also be this thing. Right. You know, and right. that's the important of representation. It's right. it's that you allow other people to have that same dream that everybody else gets to have. Black and Latino are often labeled as mutually exclusive. One is a race and the other an ethnicity, but Afro-Latinos make up about a quarter of the U.S. Latinx population. Their presence and impact on the culture can't be denied. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are more people of African descent than in any other part of the world outside of Africa. So even though Black History Month is a North American tradition, it would make sense to celebrate it in Latin America too. Bottom line, many of the contributions of Afro-Latinos have been ignored for way too long. And comments like, what are you? Or, but where are you really from? Have, to the dismay of bicultural and ethnically ambiguous people everywhere, initiated discussions about identity. Yeah, like maybe just say, what's your ethnicity? Lou, that's genius. Thank you. Despite the obvious lack of representation for Afro-Latinos, content creators and storytellers are putting representation at the forefront highlighting the community stories and hopefully quieting some of the confusion. I started Black Thena to create a space for Afro-Latinx and Caribbean people to celebrate our culture and history through story. I remember in 2016 watching Edna Valencia, Afro-Colombian journalist, lament about the deaths of Black women in Colombia. At that moment, I decided to focus all my Hollywood efforts on the Afro-Latinx community. I knew I had the power to change how we were viewed on screen and I decided to focus on the celebration. Afro-Latinos tend to get lost within Latin Iraq. And I noticed last year that what I was waiting for was never going to happen. I thought surely with the spotlight on blackness in 2020, Afro-Latinx people would be recognized and promoted at the executive level. But instead I saw more tokenism. So I stopped looking around and I started looking in the mirror. Although I feel like I have a long way to go industry-wise, I created the Platino Pipeline to empower Afro-Latinx and Afro-Caribbean professionals in Hollywood navigate those systems. Our monthly webinars provide access to Hollywood insiders, and for people who have felt like they've never belonged, the Platinum Pipeline delivers on our promise. It's a place for us to connect and dissect our strategy so we can work smarter, not harder. My name is Aisha Court, and I'm the founder of Bella Negra. I am so thankful that Black Teen exists. I'm so thankful for this project by Nydia Simone because she works to amplify our voices in all ways, every day. Black Tina has been such an incredible resource for me. Not only is Nydia my friend, she has also connected me with industry professionals, new friends, other writers, actresses, comedians, producers. I've been able to advance my career in ways that feel good for me. After living in numerous Latin American and Caribbean communities and many different cities within those communities, I've learned that many of the systems that marginalize and oppress us are validated by our own community. We have the power to change these systems, and that's what I'm doing every day, poco a poco. Each day, I have more accomplishments under my belt and more power to create the change I want to see on and off screen. Palante! About 45 of the 65 million Latinos in the U.S. were recorded as identifying as other on the U.S. Census, which is more than ever before. And as Latinx people, we don't fit into distinct racial categories, and our collective reckoning with that didn't exactly happen overnight or by accident. Colectivo Ile was founded in 1992 by Maria Reina Pumarejo and Raúl Quiñones Rosado when they were living in Massachusetts as the Institute of Latino Empowerment. Then they moved to Puerto Rico in 1997 and continued the decolonial and anti-racist work through Colectivo Ile. In 2020, we worked on another campaign. Eh, en el censo, donde me pongo? Where do I put myself on the census? We suggested picking more than one race, choosing black if you're a black Puerto Rican, and also writing a for the sender in the number seven question, the, the race question. I want to recognize the role played by Latinx media in the collective reckoning of Latinx and Afro-Latinx communities concerning race. After George Floyd's assassination in May 2020, the interest by the media to know why Black people in Latin America and Afro-Latinx were claiming that their Black Lives Matter as well was an important momentum to the self-recognition, the self-identification, the self-racial identification 
of how they are treated as BIPOC, POC, Brown, Latinx, Hispanic, etc. in the U.S. clearly as non-white. ILE is my space to celebrate my and our ancestors to co-create and most importantly, a safe space for the Afro sorority and Afro healing. There has always been a need for alternative media, more specifically, media sources that are inclusive and reflective of the actual makeup of this country. Yeah, especially since mainstream media has long pigeonholed to ethnic groups and to stereotypes and caricatures and continues to gatekeep content creators from controlling their own narrative. Yeah, when it comes specifically to news media, Alternative voices increase our ability to understand and appreciate different viewpoints. And over the last decade or so, there have been some exciting new voices making an impact through alternative news media. True inclusion is really about not only having diverse stories shared and told, but also having the people that actually are of those communities at the table telling the story. Ainta Latina was really birthed out of a lived experience. I was one of those kids that was very into media because I grew up in a household where we were Black, we were Indigenous, and that was like what it was. But I didn't always see that reflected in the media that I was consuming. I've worked in what is considered niche media, so I worked in um, legacy African-American outlets. I also worked in um, Latinx media. And so again, in those spaces, um, I realized like where was their, um, the Afro-Latina specifically narrative. And so I took that as an opportunity to really create a platform that I knew I would gravitate toward. I knew my friends and, you know, family would as well. I think there's becoming a greater awareness of how the power of independent media and social media platforms in changing the trajectory of the conversation and who is at the table. Black and Indigenous women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, according to the CDC. Sorry for the buzzkill, but it's a horrifying statistic that should force us to take a hard look at the American healthcare system. And given that this year's theme for Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness, it's an opportunity to highlight Black practitioners who are working to make a difference in the space of women's reproductive health. It is completely important and actually quite imperative to express and to continue the narrative of the disparities that are occurring within our communities. You see probably about 700 um, maternal mortalities a year, and that's within the U.S. The National Black Doula Association is more than just a directory. It's actually a community for Black doulas. What we want to do is actually train them to be able to deal with some of the disparities that we're talking about and seeing in, in the U.S. And we're going to start training our families as well in childbirth education because that's the critical piece in terms of advocacy. If you don't know what you need, you don't know how to ask for what you need. Lou, what would you say is one of the most successful marriages in Afro-Latinx culture, and why would you say reggaeton? Well, I am in Miami, so if I said anything else, would I ever be allowed back? No. Thankfully, we have music historians like Gata to give us a little history on the Afro beats at the heart of almost all Latin American music. From merengue to salsa to bachata to reggaeton. I'm Gata y estamos en Vibras Buenas, talking about black girl magic and music with none other than Goyo of Chocitán. Bueno, muy contenta, muy feliz con, con esta oportunidad que tengo de conectarme con ustedes. Eh, ¿Qué significa para ti de Superestrella ser capaz de crear cultura y compartirla en, a la escala masiva? ¿Qué está haciendo? Es una oportunidad que tengo y que no quiero desaprovechar porque pienso que a mucha gente no le pasa saber que es muy chévere porque por medio de lo que tú dices o por medio de tu, de tu estilo de vida se puede conocer mucho de, de tu cultura, de tu gente. Es un gran reto, es un gran reto, pero al mismo tiempo es lo que me da la vitalidad y, y lo que me ayuda en el día a día para poder seguir creando. Dime por favor, o sea, si usted puede definir cuál es Black Girl Magic, el tumbao que tiene la negra. Significa la actitud, si ¿sí me entiendes, es uno tener el autoconocimiento 
de uno mismo, la autoconfianza y el deseo de, de brillar, porque sabemos que a muchas mujeres como yo eh, les toca trabajar el doble en la industria musical, en nuestra sociedad y todo eso. Para mí es una, una frase que empodera y como un mantra, porque cada vez que uno lo dice, uno se siente en posición de Black Girl Magic. ¿Cuáles son tus tres principales momentos culturales? Si vamos a celebrar negritud, ¿cuáles son? A mí me gusta mucho repetirme la idea de lo que hizo Rosa Park. Me parece que es algo que debe quedar marcado. Porque soy mujer, porque soy afro, y obviamente por lo que significó para mucha gente el, el hecho de haber conocido a la negra grande de Colombia. Pese a que no es de mi generación, ella abrió mucho camino e inspiró a mucha gente, entre esos a mi mamá. Tengo la idea también como artista de decir, ok, si ella puede, yo también puedo. Cuando sucedió el de George Floyd, fue un momento que marcó mucho el mundo. Nadie había visto algo así. Yo creo que fue un antes y un después de Goyo, más que todo lo que yo empecé a comunicar. Wow, pero eso sí fueron vibras muy buenas. That's all of the time that I have for today. I'm Gata, and this is Raider Telemundo. Ok, so we gotta talk about all this voter suppression that's been going on. I mean, it's no secret that this country has a long and sordid history with suppressing the black vote. It seems like the more diverse the country gets, the more state-level efforts increase to disproportionately reduce the rights of eligible black and brown voters. On the federal level, officials aren't only refusing to protect people's civil rights, some are even forgetting that all eligible voters are equally American. Isn't that right, Mitch? If you look at the statistics, African-American voters are voting in just as high a percentage as Americans. Well, there was swift reaction and condemnation from Democrats and voting rights groups. In the 2020 presidential race, black and Latino voters played a major role in swinging election results in several battleground states, thanks in large parts to the efforts of remarkable civic engagement leaders like Stacey Abrams. You're the real MVP, Stacey. But our work is far from over. And with the midterms fast approaching, we need to re-engage with communities that have been neglected for way too long. I grew up in a very proud Black Latino family. So for me, being Afro-Latino is who I am. It's like the fabric of, of, of my family, of my life, of my community. Creating positive change in your community starts at the ballot box, ensuring that you are showing up for the Latino community, that you're voting every election cycle, that you are running for office yourself. If you think you're ready, if you think you can make a change and impact, come talk to us at Latino Victory. The fight for voting rights is far from over, and Latinos have, we have a once-in-a-lifetime generic opportunity to protect our right to live in a democracy that works for everyone. And that starts with voting, ensuring that you are uh, registered to vote, making sure that you are making calls, that you're engaged at the local level, and that you are uh, talking to your peers and talking to your community members about the need for voting protection law. It's really important to understand that Latinos are not a monolith. What matters to Latinos in Florida may not be what is important for people in Texas and California and New York. And that is the approach that organizations like Latino Victory take. Being Afro-Latina, it is one of my greatest pride as well as one of my greatest strengths. Uh, knowing what our community have gone through and where we are and where we're going, it is a privilege to being able to belong to such a vibrant, resilient community. We have a strong Afroculture within, within our own Latino community that I feel like it needs to be embraced. It needs to be more welcomed, not just during Black History Month, right? Like it needs to happen throughout the year because our culture is Latino culture. In the past few years, there's been an uptick in curriculum censorship, which is basically when a bunch of politicians try to make certain topics off limits in public schools, like with the now infamous Don't Say Gay Bill, or with the far right's favorite boogeyman, critical race theory. Fortunately, some educators are making it their personal mission to thwart these attempts by insisting on the importance of teaching evolution of race relations in the U.S. Yeah, so hopefully we can learn from our history and not be like, uh, you know, um, doomed to repeat it. It's not a secret how we make education more inclusive. We do that by, first of all, including different communities in decision making. Secondly, by not segregating our resources or targeting our resources so that uh, communities and people who have 
a more difficult situation, have more resources. For a good part of American history, we thought education was the, the way in which we created community, created understanding. It was a public good. In the late 60s, early 70s, we started thinking, thinking of education as a private good, not a public good. And people use education to hoard resources. So right now, education is actually contributing to the disparities and pulling the country apart, as opposed to leveling the playing field and bringing people together. Now I'm the director of something called the Othering and Belonging Institute. And it's really global in its focus. Uh, and we believe that the world, we need to create a world where everyone belongs. We want to challenge othering wherever we find it, both at an interpersonal level, structural level, cultural level, and promote belonging, a world where everyone belongs and we belong to the earth itself. Black History Month can be traced back to the 1920s where it began as a week-long event until it evolved into a longer celebration in the late 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. The idea was to create a larger awareness of Black identity, honor our legacy, and celebrate our accomplishments. So, you're welcome. Speaking of celebrating accomplishments, I hear Miami has some delicious Haitian food that you uh, celebrated quite thoroughly before the show, so we might have to go celebrate again. I mean, in the name of cultural awareness, I can make that happen. Sweet. This looks good. Yeah. But yeah, um, well, I'm Lou Lewis, she's Gabby Frescas from Radar 2022. Hey, save me a bite. Thanks for watching Radar 2022. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, we've all got issues. Some of us more than others.